Good morning. My chronometer says 7 o'clock in the morning. Your chairman this morning is in Chicago on business for the American College of Surgeons. and Couldn't be here today, but we're going to start off uh, today's Grand Rounds with uh, Dr. Everett. I'm presenting a case of pneumothorax with mediastinal shift and why it's always important to keep a broad differential. I just want to thank Dr. Smith for helping me with this presentation. So this was a baby that was five months old. He presented after having two days of cough, wheezing, and congestion. Uh, and his mother noticed on the day he came to the emergency room that he was having some increased work of breathing and irritability. And of note, he did have some sick siblings at home. Um, so far, he's up to date on his vaccinations. He had normal well baby exams. Um, nothing significant in his birth history. Hadn't been operated on yet. When he came to the emergency room, he was initially hypertensive for his age. Uh, he was tachycardic, he was tachypnic, and he was hypoxic. And they gave him four liters of oxygen and his vitals improved. Um, of note, the ED said that he did have some decreased breath sounds on the left and accessory muscle use. So they obtained a chest x-ray. And you can see here that he has markedly hyperlucent left hemithorax with a large right mediastinal shift. He also has some atelectasis on both sides. So the emergency room just proceeded to perform a needle decompression of the left side of the chest. Um, the, this was also the time at which they called us and they called the ICU team as well. So this was after they did their needle decompression here and you can still see that there's marked hyperlucency on this left side of the chest with shift. So there really wasn't any improvement. We placed a eight French pigtail catheter on the lateral position and he still had persistent pneumothorax, but it was improved and he still had mediastinal shift. Uh, when we put the chest tube to suction, you can see that he had a good improvement. Um, at this point, he was monitored in the emergency room and transferred to the pediatric floor. About nine hours later, he had his AM chest x-ray and you can see that his pneumothorax had worsened. Um, he remained stable at this time. He was on about half a liter of nasal cannula oxygen and satting 99 to 100%. So at this time, we adjusted the equipment and the chest tube, tried to see if we could improve this pneumothorax, get things working a little better. Um, he did not improve, so he was transferred to the ICU and he was, the pigtail catheter was exchanged for a 10 French chest tube. Uh, chest x-ray was obtained and again you can see that he still has this persistent pneumothorax that's not improving. Um, so this time we did a CT scan since this wasn't following the normal course and we ruled out that the pigtail catheter was occluded. Um, he did not. Originally he did and then he didn't. So originally they were able to get out air and then he wouldn't. And this is his CT findings. So you can see here that there's this large multiloculated cystic structure here with collapse of the left lung and atelectasis on both sides. And then here is another smaller cystic area on the left lower lobe. The original one was presenting in the left upper lobe. And then on his coronal views, you can again, oops, not going. Again, see this large cystic structure causing shift of his mediastinum and overexpansion of the left hemithorax there with atelectasis on both sides. Um, originally, this was thought to be a tension pneumothorax, which is why it was proceeded with needle decompression and placing a chest tube. And since it wasn't following a standard course, the scans were obtained and we could see that this was in fact some sort of cystic mass rather than a pneumothorax. Baby was taken to the operating room two days later to remove the cystic structure. We did a diagnostic bronchoscopy first to rule out foreign body causing airway obstruction and then we proceeded with a left thoracotomy 
Uh, we did this with the standard posterior lateral incision. The cystic structure was already decompressed on entry into the chest because of the needle decompression that was performed in the ED. Uh, we dissected it free from the lung parenchyma and removed it intact from the lung. And so here, this is the head of the patient, feet are over here, this is dorsal ventral surface. Um, this is the cyst here, it had already been decompressed, so we opened it up and mobilized it and removed it from the lung tissue. And then the raw surface of the lung after the cyst was removed intact was closed with the simple running back and forth technique with 5-0 proline suture. And this here you can see the lung parenchyma sutured closed. Um, at this time the ET tube was withdrawn to allow air to flow back through the left main stem and we had good inflation of the lung with no air leak on bubble test. And this is just video of the lung expanded after we had finished our repair. Um, we placed the chest tube at the end of the case and closed the chest cavity with three layers of absorbable sutures. The uh, patient was transferred back to the pediatric ICU and eventually to the floor. He had his chest tube removed on post-op day four. He was discharged post-op day five. And he actually has his follow-up appointment in clinic today. This was his chest x-ray at discharge where you can see that he has an overall better expansion of his left lung parenchyma and his mediastinum has improved positioning. Um, you can still appreciate here that smaller cystic lesion on the left lower lobe. We were not able to access it from when we were in the case and since it was small it was left intact. So a little bit about congenital malformations of the lower respiratory tract. Uh, these are pretty rare. They're about 1 in 11,000 to 35,000 live births. Uh, some of the more recent studies are, they're a little more common. I saw up to 1 in 2,500 live births. I think that's due to the better prenatal imaging and ultrasound and smaller lesions being picked up more frequently. The overwhelming majority of these are called CPAMs and then something called BPS is even more rare um, and of these this big number here are only 6.4%, or 1.5, 0.15 to 6.4% are BPS. So what are these? CPAM is a congenital pulmonary airway malformation. It's developmental malformation of the lower respiratory tract. Um, they occur sporadically. They haven't been related to any maternal factors such as race, age, or exposures. Most are diagnosed, as I said, on routine prenatal ultrasound. Uh, ultrasound's about 81% sensitivity for detecting a CPAM. And about three-fourths of those that are diagnosed prenatally will present asymptomatically at birth. And again, I think this is due to picking up smaller lesions on better imaging. Um, about one-third that are diagnosed after the neonatal period will present with recurrent pneumonias or respiratory symptoms. And so the clinical presentation is often dependent on the type and size of the cyst. Large cysts present with more respiratory symptoms. You can see mediastinal shift, flattening of the ipsilateral diaphragm, and then smaller cysts. This says that they present later in life, usually as an incidental finding or recurrent pneumonias. Um, classification system for CPAMs. There was one in place that broke them down into four different types, three different types of lesions. And within the last 10 years, this has changed, and they've now broken up into five different types. Of note, the type zero, these are not compatible with life. Uh, type one is your most common type here. It's usually in your distal bronchi, proximal bronchioles. It's usually one single large cyst. Type two, uh, these are usually associated with other congenital anomalies, and that's how these are discovered because the baby's being imaged for other things, and then this is picked up as well, incidentally. Type three, these are small cysts that combine to form a large mass, and these usually present with serious respiratory complications. And then type four, um, they're usually a single cyst, less than or equal to seven centimeters. These are strongly associated with a malignant potential, especially PPB, which is pleuropulmonary blastoma, which we're gonna get into in a little bit. And these babies can present with tension pneumothorax or infection.
So the second most common type of congenital lung malformation is bronchopulmonary sequestration. It's first described in 1946. This is an extraneous non-functioning lung tissue that doesn't communicate with the tracheobronchial tree, and it receives its blood supply from the systemic circulation. A lot of times on imaging that the BPS and CPAM are hard to distinguish until you get an MRI and you can see this aberrant systemic feeder feeding the cyst. They're broken up into intralobar lesions, which are lo located in the lung parenchyma and they don't have their own pleura, or extralobar, which are external to the lung parenchyma and they have their own pleura. Um, they've also described hybrid BPS and CPAM lesions where they have the histologic features of a CPAM but they're fed with a systemic arterial blood supply. Well, this is just putting the two side by side. So your CPAMs are supplied by the pulmonary vessels, whereas BPS gets the systemic circulation. Um, BPS does not communicate with the tracheobronchial tree. They're broken down differently. CPAMs are more common in males versus females, and they both have some sort of association with congenital anomalies. On of note, surgical resection is the definitive management for both type of congenital lung malformations. So what kind of surgical approach are you going to do? The standard of care is to do a lobectomy. Um, they've also described wedge resections, non-anatomical resections, and very rarely doing um, an entire pneumonectomy. You can do a thoracotomy or you can do minimally invasive with the VATS. For the thoracotomy, I'm going to go into this a little bit more since this is what we did. Uh, standard posterior lateral incision can be used or muscle sparing thoracotomy. The muscle sparing thoracotomy, you isolate off your latissimus dorsi muscle and you retract it and then you spread the serratus anterior here to expose your rib space. Uh, this is in comparison to the standard posterior lateral incision where you typically divide through your latissimus dorsi muscle. Some of the advantage to doing a standard approach is better exposure. And if you have to expand your incision, it's easier to do. Whereas the muscle sparing thoracotomy, uh, they typically have less chest wall deformities later in life and musculoskeletal complications and less pain, but you have a smaller exposure for your operation. And this was an article that's comparing the muscle sparing thoracotomy to the standard posterior lateral thoracotomy in the pediatric age. It's a retrospective comparison of postoperative morbidity and late musculoskeletal anomalies to the two different approaches. They looked at 90 total patients, 50 underwent standard thoracotomy, and 40 underwent muscles, muscle sparing thoracotomy. And they were both patient populations, average age at surgery was about four years. And so here, group one represents the standard thoracotomy patients and group two represents your muscle sparing. Um, it was significant that they found in muscle sparing thoracotomy, they regained their shoulder girdle movement faster. They had less pain when using the average pa face, pans, face pain score. And they had a shorter extubation time, a shorter ICU stay, and a shorter hospital stay. There wasn't any statistical significance in perioperative complications, such as having to re-explore seroma formation or wound infections, although there were more seromas in the muscle sparing thoracotomy, it just wasn't significant. And there was no difference in mortality between the two groups, and there was actually no mortality between any of these patients that were operated on. And then in the table over here, this was looking at your musculoskeletal deformities at follow-up, and it was significant that the muscle sparing incision has less association with scoliosis, elevation of the shoulder, winged scapula, or asymmetry of the nipples. So they concluded that muscle sparing incisions in the pediatric age result in one un more uneventful post-op course and less th thoracic deformities at follow-up. The next article that I looked at was comparing the open approach versus minimally invasive. This looked at 30-day outcomes. Um, all the data was acquired from national database. They had 112 patients that underwent thoracoscopic resections and 146 underwent open. They were mostly looking at operative time, early post-op complications, readmission, and mortality. And 
In this study, the mean age at operation was one and a half years. The majority of these patients were actually operated on at less than one year of age. Uh, these are the pre-op patient demographics. Um, the most common comorbidities of these patients before surgery were prematurity, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, chronic lung disease, oxygen requirement, and nutritional support. And it was statistically significant that these common comorbidities and pre-op conditions were in the open population as opposed to the minimally invasive population. And so the patients that received an open resection were younger and they were of a sicker patient population. And here you can see that most of these operations, they were done electively and they were lobectomies. Lobectomy is usually done in the range of 80 to 90 percent of operations for CPAMs and BPS. The conversion rate to open was 2.7 percent and the babies that did undergo a conversion, they were still evaluated in the minimally invasive population. Here you can see the surgical outcomes for patients in the thoracoscopic versus the open populations. Um, originally, they did found, find that it was statistically significant that there was a shorter length of stay and less complications, specifically transfusion and ventilator requirement at greater than or equal to 48 hours in the thoracoscopic population. Um, when they accounted for the fact that patients who typically underwent open were of a younger and sickier population and did a risk adjustment, they found that there actually was no statistical significance between the two groups as far as operative time, length of stay, post-op complications, transfusion requirements, and ventilator requirements. And so they concluded that both approaches were equal in those aspects. However, with your minimally invasive techniques, uh, you do avoid the big incision of the thoracotomy, so they have less chest wall deformities, less scoliosis, shoulder weakness, and better cosmesis. Whereas doing a minimally invasive approach, it's technically difficult in infants. Um, you do have less exposure. They have a more delicate pulmonary anatomy and they have reduced pulmonary reserve on thoracic insufflation. And the next thing that we looked at was surgical versus conservative management of congenital pulmonary airway malformations in children. This was of a debate for a long time. I think it's kind of coming to the wayside because of all the research that shows that surgery is beneficial for um, symptomatic, especially, and even asymptomatic lesions. So they compared the post-op outcomes associated with elective surgery, specifically in the asymptomatic population, versus surgery as part of expectant management. And this means that this was they did surgery once the patient started to have symptoms. It was non-randomized prospective study, and then eight retrospective studies were included in their review. Looked at 168 patients, 70 underwent surgery before they developed symptoms, and 63 to underwent surgery after development of symptoms, and 35 of the non-surgical patients, 35 of the patients were managed non-surgically. Um, of note, these were only followed for less than three years of life, and so it's unknown whether they might have developed symptoms later in life, because there's reports that babies can, or children can develop symptoms all the way out until 16 years of age, adulthood. And the primary outcomes they looked at were post-op morbidity, and secondarily, they looked at length of stay. Here you can see that elective surgery for asymptomatic, when the patient was still asymptomatic, had 10% post-op complication rate. And surgery after the babies started to develop symptoms had a 32% post-op complication rate. Um, they both had complications of pneumothorax after surgery. The symptomatic group had more bronco, bronchopleural fistulas, uh, more transfusion requirements. I thought that was interesting to note, and pleural effusions. So looking at their data, um, they found that the total morbidity was significantly higher when surgery was performed after symptom de symptoms developed compared to resections when patients were still asymptomatic. 
And here you can see that their data is favoring resection when the patient is asymptomatic. Um, when they did their meta-analysis, they reviewed nine studies, but this only includes seven that met criteria to include in the meta-analysis. So there are a couple of these that are missing over here. And then when they looked at length of stay, they were only able to include three of their studies to run the meta-analysis. Um, and length of stay was not significantly different between patients who had surgery while asymptomatic versus those operated on after symptom development. But the heterogeneity was high, and it doesn't include that many cases, so it's not the greatest data. And they concluded that elective resection of an asymptomatic CPAM is safe and presents, prevents the risk of symptom development just associated with a more complicated surgery and a recovery. And I think some of the the arguments, the downfalls to conservative management is there's no defined treatment algorithm of how long you follow these babies for yet or what kind of imaging that you get. Um, they're also exposed to higher radiation since they're imaged for so many years out. They have more hospital emissions and they also run the risk of getting recurrent pneumonias. Um, and then as we talked about before, with the type 4 CPAMs and the type 2 CPAMs, they do have a malignant potential. So if you don't operate on them, they, it's rare and small, but they do have the risk of developing cancer later in life where the main risk for operating on them when they're asymptomatic as a baby is just the risk of surgery itself. Um, they're not really been shown when you operate on, on them asymptomatic that they have lots of morbidity from their surgery. And also in the asymptomatic populations, um, they don't really present with respiratory distress through life. Um, they pretty much kind of get surgery and they do okay. And then this study here, this was actually published in January of this year. This was looking at the symptomatic population since it is known that the asymptomatic patients, they do okay long term from their operations. They wanted to know how the symptomatic babies, the ones that present on day one with symptoms, how they do long term later in life. And so this was retrospectively reviewed 102 neonates that had um, congenital lung malformations. And of those 102, 21 had symptomatic disease in the newborn. They only included 20 in the final analysis. One of the babies was made comfort care at birth. Um, this, uh, their demographics I thought were interesting because it showed consistent with what we know is that it's more common in males. You, more common to have a left-sided mass, and CPAMs are the most common lesions that we see. So of these symptomatic babies that presented right at birth, their median, late, median length of hospitalization was 36.5 days. Um, this was significantly correlated with their gestational age at birth and with their birth weight. Um, it was not shown to be correlated with if they had high drops, um, CVR, which is the cystic volume ratio, it's a measure of the size of the cyst compared to the fetal head. Um, and there's been data showing that if this number is less than one, then usually then about 95% of those do not have symptoms at birth. So if your CVR is greater than one, which we can see that we had in our study, then they usually present with symptoms. So um, of the 20 patients they had that were operated on, six of them had a persistent air leak and prolonged chest tube drainage. Six of them developed pulmonary hypotension and five were on ECMO after surgery. When they followed them up long term, about three years, all children, um, they had six of the 20 children were discharged home on supplemental oxygen. By three years out, they had all been weaned. 50% of them still required daily bronchodilators. Two of them were subsequently diagnosed with pectus excavatum, and one syndromic child died from aspiration pneumonia later, but all 20 of them originally had survived their surgery. So back to our case, when we got our pathology back, it actually came back as pleuropulmonary blastoma type 1. Uh, this is a picture of our, the cyst when we resected it, and this is when we sent it off to pathology for examination. They sent this specimen over to Washington University, St. Louis, to get a, an expert opinion. 
because it was not your typical CPAM that you resect in a child. So what is pleuropulmonary blastoma? It was first described in 1998, and there's only 500 described cases worldwide so far. It's been divided into three different types. Type 1, which is what we had, is usually cystic. As time goes on, these become more solid in nature, and they are often, they're typed by age as well. So uh, most patients are diagnosed before age 6 when they have this, and malignant metastatic potential goes up as you go down the board, and um, so does mortality as well. And so back to what we had before is that they're associated with type 4 CPAMs, although they're difficult to distinguish pathologically, and you pretty much can't distinguish it until you actually get your pathology. Um, it's unknown whether it's just an association or if the type 4 CPAM degenerates into a cancer. It's not quite clear yet. What they have found is that it's associated with a DICER-1 mutation. Local recurrences are frequent, and mortality rate's about 40%. Treatment is evolving. Um, surgical resection is well known, and chemotherapy is pretty much used. The use of radiation therapy is not as clear. So this is the International Pulmonary Blastoma DICER-1 registry, and they are still actively collecting cases to better study these tumors and come up with better treatment um, strategies for them, and we enrolled our case into this registry. So what's next for this patient? If you can remember, he had this smaller cyst in his left lower lobe of his lung. Um, that has a chance of being malignant and being a pleuropulmonary blastoma, so he's going to need it resected in the future. Um, he's been referred to pulmonology, and he's been referred to hemonc, and he's going to be presented at tumor board to decide um, when to do chemo. Do you do it before surgery? Do you do it after uh, he's going to need to be re-scanned to see, to better characterize this lesion, see if there's any others, and kind of decide when it's best to resect this. So he's unfortunately not out of the woods just yet. And that's it. All righty, that was uh, pretty exhaustive. We have Dr. Smith here as well. Open the floor up to questions. I mean, uh, one of the questions I had was, uh, you did not do a lobectomy on this patient, or you did do a lobectomy? It's hard to say. We got the cyst out with good margins. It came freely. Um, if we was talking to Dr. Smith about this, I had the same question. If you could probably classify it as a lobectomy, but what we do know is that we got the full cyst, and that was what mattered. And uh, for these type of cysts, when you talk about chemotherapy, is that only if there's malignant uh, change present, or is it just because the cyst is there? Um, they often get chemo even with resection. So if he didn't have a secondary cyst still in the lung, then he would still receive chemo. Questions from the floor? Sounds like it's a uh, pretty small subset of patients who have this, but is there any role for, you know, a percutaneous biopsy technique to kind of nail down that last remaining cyst, whether or not it has malignant potential? Mm, I, I don't think so. I think since he already had one that was malignant, that you would just take the whole cyst out. Um, even if it's not malignant now, they do have the potential for malignancy later in life, and so I think that even if you get a biopsy that says it's not malignant now, then who's to say in 10, 20 years that it does become malignant? And they do pretty well um, afterwards, and that one's small, so I think his recovery will be fine from the resecting it. Dr. Smith. I, I think that is this on? I got it now. I think this is this is a curious case, and it's one of those cases that makes pediatric surgery fun of sorts. It's not fun for the child or the family by any means, but from a diagnostic standpoint, um, once you get your hands wrapped around what was clinically going on in the emergency room and how we proceeded on to the scan to look for a congenital malformation, um, 
now what do you do? You, you operate, and any other number of times, this is not a, a pre-malignant or malignant lesion. These are malformations. You remove the malformation. And the small cyst at the bottom was not clinically apparent. We were dealing with a chest that was very shifted, low pulmonary reserve. We required the open operation to not um, force the child to undergo any more thoracic insufflation. And we get this little cyst out, cannot find clinically easily the lower lobe, so we decided not to proceed on with left lower lobectomy for the intralobar one that's below. Notice that's not perched on the edge. When you look at that scan, that little cyst is truly intralobar, and that's going to require lobectomy. Uh, we decided to let the child grow and come back another day. Now we've got a little fire behind us to go ahead and uh, remove it. I, I think we do have to remove it. I think there's malignant potential. I think the genetic studies will help us decide the speed with which we should do uh, the following case. And as well, because the deformity was such that we really didn't know if we got a full and complete lobectomy and this thing just shelled off in a true segmental fashion from the upper lobe, uh, do we need to do a uh, total resection of that lung, which would require us to do some sort of plombage, not doing it now with ping pong balls, but we use breast implants now to allow that child's chest to grow on that side. Those are all questions that have to be answered from a technical standpoint as well as from the uh, cancer standpoint. Additionally, I wanted to comment on the study from Canada, and I wanted you to notice that given how many people had to opt for had to opt for non-operative management or a delayed management realize how long your waits are in the Canadian system and it's interesting that that's where that data came out of so waiting for a surgeon is is part of the Canadian way yeah it's a it's a total mind shift of uh, what you're willing to accept all right well Bob go ahead we'll, and then we'll move on to the next case so we have Dr. Olzer has enough time. Dr. Olzer, you want to start loading your... Great presentation. Just real quick, either you or Dr. Smith, I mean, is there a role for a pneumonectomy in this patient? Uh, I guess that's what Dr. Smith was that's alluding to. Saying, yeah. I think that's the most aggressive uh, posture to take, isn't it? Right. That's I, I saw not many babies at all underwent pneumonectomy, but I think for him, since we just took this, kind of took the cyst, so we don't know if there's still cancer in that left upper lobe and we take the left lower lobe, it's going to kind of, I don't know. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> All righty. Thank you very much. Dr. Olsner, do you think you need the, you think you need this microphone or are you okay with that? I'm fine speaking up. Yes, sir. So um, this, this case is a very unusual presentation for a spontaneous hematoma um, based on the clinical uh, behavior of it um, and the um, imaging. It raised questions on um, whether, whether or not there was an underlying bleeding neoplasm. And so I, I, I'd like you all to um, keep that in mind during this presentation. Um, I, I'd also like to thank Dr. Vai for helping me with this case. Uh, the patient is a 74-year or 70-year-old male who presented um, to the ER with a large um, exophytic bleeding mass on his left um, lateral chest wall. Um, the patient reports that it presented; a, he, he's had the mass for most of his life. However, it was the size of a small gumball, um, and over the past two weeks, it had rapidly increased in size. He report, reported a one-week history of serous drainage, and on the day of presentation, he reported that it has started bleeding. Um, with movement of his left arm, it elicits sharp pain. Um, 
Interestingly, the patient was discharged from Erlinger um, one week prior and was transferred directly from Health South to the ER. Um, at that time, um, he was diagnosed with a, a new ischemic thalamic stroke and had been placed on aspirin. The patient also um, re reported a 20-pound weight loss over about a month and a half. Um, the patient's past medical history include polycythemia varia, hypertension. He had um, multiple fleshy um, skin tags over his neck, arms, um, and torso. Uh, and these were present since childbirth. He also had cafe au lait spots. Um, his medications include a statin, um, aspirin from the new ischemic thalamic stroke, and folic acid. He had a prior inguinal hernia repair. And his family history included a brother with neurofibromatosis type 1 who had um, recently undergone uh, spinal surgery for a lesion. And he also had an, an uncle who also had neurofibromas. At presentation, the patient was hemodynamically stable, um, afebrile. His white blood cell count was 33, hematocrit was 48. Um, he had an elevated um, PTT and um, um, increased level of platelets at um, over 450. On physical exam, um, there was notable um, fleshy skin tags on his neck, torso, arms, um, cafe au lait spots, uh, axillary freckling. The mass, it was quite large. It was 15 by 17 by 12 centimeters in height. Um, it was fungative. Um, there was areas of ulceration, um, areas of black eschar, um, and pinpoint breed, um, bleeding throughout the, um, I guess, posterior surface of the mass. Um, also superior to the, superior and inferior to the mass, there was areas of ecchymosis that had showed evidence of age, aging as well. The patient was taken to a CT scanner. Um, the, it, it showed an um, exophytic mass, suggestive of a large hematoma. There was compression of underlying tissue structures, and uh, um, underlying um, lesion could not be excluded based on the, the imaging at this time. Here is a, a little bit inferior to the, um, that prior image. You can see how the, the mass is, is nodular, um, and there was a questionable septate area in it. When the patient had presented a month earlier for his thalamic stroke, he had undergone a CT abdomen. Um, on the, one of the upper level uh, chest um, slices in that um, abdominal CT, you can see the, um, the left atrium with the pulmonic veins. Uh, at the same level, this is the new scan. Um, there is no mass prior in his um, CT imaging from the month prior. This doesn't exclude a, a smaller mass that might have been uh, present and is now located in this um, with external compression and having the mass being pushed down in structures is present now where it wasn't earlier. The patient um, two days later underwent um, uh, IR embolization of the structure. It was noted to be highly vascularized with neovascularization in the mass. Um, there was numer uh, numerous parasitizing branches off of the proximal um, axillary artery. There was also parasitizing br branches downstream of the left thoracodorsal um, artery, as well as the posterior circumflex artery. Uh, the patient ultimately underwent um, coiling of both the thoracodorsal artery and the posterior circumflex um, artery. Following IR embolization, um, this, was take, this photo was taken the, the same day as the, the procedure. Um, you can see that there's more advancement of the black eschar skin necrosis. The mass is still very friable. Um, you, have the, you can see the large ecchymosis and the surrounding um, tissue that's flat to the surface of the patient's um, torso. Um, and the bleeding had decreased somewhat. Um, at this point, we did not know whether or not there was an underlying um, potentially bleeding neoplasm that was causing this um, spontaneous um, hematoma. So the patient had under, uh, underwent uh, an IR, or sorry, MRI the following day. Um, the MRI showed um, heterogeneous um, T2 hyperintensity, but it also showed an internal septation, um, thickening and enhancement of the posterior wall, uh, as well as the septation. 
and it showed decreased um, um, of the flat plane between the musculature and the, and the hematoma. Um, on the morning of the 16th, the patient had started having a, a low-grade um, fever. Um, his hematocrit at presentation was 48 to the ED. Um, it had slowly been decreasing over the last four days and now is 31. Uh, it was determined at this time that we would um, take the patient for um, resection of the mass and hematoma. Um, we, we, he was at higher risk of having an infection um, given that there was evidence of necrosis. We decided that because we didn't know if there was an underlying bleeding neoplasm um, on the, the mass and it was too risky to undergo a biopsy, we decided to take a two centimeter peripheral margin. Um, we used sharp debridement, um, electric artery. Um, of note, during the excision, it was very friable. There was multiple um, uh, perforating um, blood vessels. Re it required multiple suture ligations, electric artery. Um, it was a slow dissection because of the vascularity. Um, it was also, there was no clear infiltration of the, the mass into the um, musculature. Uh, the plane was very clear um, and it was an easier dissection with respect to the plane. Um, following resection, um, we used a combination of um, chemo, um, hemostasis with um, hydrogen peroxide as well as Arista, which is a purified um, starch product um, from potatoes to maintain hemostasis after the removal of the lesion. Um, and this comparison is a good comparison just to show the depth of the mass itself. Um, the final dimensions end up being um, 13 centimeters by 15 centimeters in length with a depth of 12 centimeters. And then the excised um, lesion left in the, the patient's um, chest wall was 14 centimeters by 17 centimeters. Um, this image, image also shows the underside size of the mass. Um, you can see some um, evidence of coagulation as well as thickened fibrous tissue. At this point, we had presumed that there was an underlying neoplasm that was causing this spontaneous hemorrhage and hematoma. Um, we had not seen a hematoma present with such an exophytic, nodular, um, and acute presentation like this. Um, given that the patient had um, evidence of neurofibromas on his torso, axillary freckling, um, cafe au lait spots, a first degree relative with neurofibromatosis, um, we had, um, our hypothesis at this time was that um, this could be a hemorrhagic neurofibroma. When we got the pathology, um, it didn't show it. Um, the pathology showed a large hematoma arising in the context of a pre-existing abscess. Um, after I, I talked with some, Dr. Summers Bowman, she's the leading pathologist expert in soft tissue masses here at Erlinger. Um, she said that often in, in tough, soft tissue masses that become hemorrhagic and present with a hematoma, there is a large destruction of the architecture. Um, and it's very hard to get a um, pathological um, cross-section that, that will show that. Um, she, did, she said that based on this, you couldn't rule it out, but you can't rule it in. Um, and strictly speaking, that the slide showed a hematoma with abscess formation. Here in the slides, you can see large feminist material with an area of um, neutrophil infiltration um, and PMNs with a central area of coagulation. On gross morphology, there was a central luminal defect in the mass um, with surrounding um, necrosis and then the, the skin over it. So for the um, rest of the talk, I'd like to talk a little bit more about neurofibromatosis. I'd like to speak a little bit more about hemorrhagic neurofibromas because um, they can present um, as a surgical um, patient and then also about the history of neurofibromatosis. Um, so neurofibromatosis is also called um, von Recklinghausen um, disease. Um, Frederick von Recklinghausen is a German um, pathologist and anatomist. 
He studied in three separate uh, universities in Bonn, Wurzenberg, and Berlin. Um, and in, um, of note, he got his PhD under Rudolf Virchow. So Virchow's triad with um, hemostasis, um, hypercoagulability, and endothelial injury for risk factors for thrombosis. Um, Frederick Recklinghaus um, in 1882 released a monograph, which is a, a long textbook um, on neurofibromas. He also coined the term hemochromatosis. So this is um, photos from his original manuscript entitled Multiple Fibromas of the Skin and their relationship to the um, multiple neuromas. So not a catchy title. Um, this is his, um, the patient that he illustrated in, in the text. Um, here he has multiple cutaneous um, neurofibromas. And then I th felt it was very interesting to look at his original schematics of um, cross sections of the cutaneous neurofibromas here. And here you have the vasculature on the inside. Um, and this is contradicts some of the literature that I, that I had seen um, that I'll present later on. Neurofibromatosis, um, it's inherent disease. Um, it affects one in um, 3,000. It has variable, uh, it has 100% penetrance, but it's variable polymorphisms. So patients present differently. Um, it's um, notable for having cutaneous neurofibromas here, um, least not nodules and pigmentation in the eyes and irises. Um, they have multiple cafe au lait birthmarks, and they also are notable to have axillary freckling. Um, Neurofibromatosis has a defect in neurofibromin, which it, um, has tumor suppressing activity. So by having a defect, they're more likely to have activation of the RAS protein which, that we'll talk about later, um, leading to tumor um, formation. They often have uh, a rare form of um, fibromas called plexiform neurofibromas, which, which are classically described as a bag of worms. Uh, because of the fragile skin and multiple blood, blood vessels, and they have an inherent risk of um, life-threatening bleeding. Um, plexiform neurofibromas occur in 30% of cases. They're most common on the face uh, um, and buttocks and less common on the torso. Um, and they can um, present as um, a patient with acute respiratory failure from um, compression. Um, and they often um, have social stigma because of their disfigurement. So how is neurofibromatosis um, diagnosed? It's diagnosed via clinical um, and not genetic. Um, and so the NIH has uh, designated seven criteria for um, neurofibromatosis. Our patient um, had fit into four of these categories. So he does have a diagnosis of neurofibromatosis. Um, namely, he has multiple cafe au lait macules. He had um, neurofibromas um, axillary freckling, and he had a first-degree relative. So if we go back to the OR photo here, you can see he has large axillary freckling. He has cafe au lait spots uh, on his arm and up here. Um, and then before we draped, he had the fleshy, neuro smaller neurofibromas here and here, and as well as a cafe au lait spot. So based on this, this case, I really had two clinical questions that I wanted to answer in the literature. Namely, one is for hemorrhagic neurofibromas, why do they rapidly expand? Why do they have prolonged bleeding? And um, why, as reported in the literature, why do they sometimes present as life-threatening um, hemorrhages? And then two is what interventions can be done for these patients? So I'll answer the first question. Um, there was a study done at the British Journal of Hematology that looked at primary hemostasis or platelet um, aggregation. And so just for a review, you have a, <clears throat> a break in the blood vessel which exposes collagen. Um, platelets interact with the collagen allowing for activation. This activation allows for the secretion of alpha granules, um, arachidonic acid, thrombin, ADP, which then causes a feed forward um, mechanism for platelet aggregation. So this study took um, isolated platelets from patients with neurofibromatosis, um, as well as patients in the general population which did not have the disease. They exposed them to collagen. And what they found was patients with neurofibromatosis had delayed platelet aggregation when exposed to collagen. So they had delayed in primary hemostasis. 
compared to the normal population. They took this um, a step further and they took wild type platelets and they resuspended them into the serum of, sorry, they took, yeah, wild type platelets, resuspended them in the serum of patients with neurofibromatosis. And what they found was they now had a delayed aggregation in these normal platelets. Um, so what their conclusion was, was that there was some unknown factor in the serum. The study did not attempt to identify that factor. Um, but it leads to um, prolonged platelet aggregation. I couldn't find another study that followed up on this study to identify what that factor may be. Um, the literature also reports vascular structural abnormalities in patients with neurofibromatosis. Um, and these could be patients that you'll, you'll see on vascular service. Um, namely, they have three types of vascular lesions. They have art, uh, arterial stenosis and occlusion. They often will have aneurysms of the large um, and medium arteries, and they can have disrupt, um, disruptions that can lead to arteriovenous fistulas. Um, the literature also in the case reports on hemorrhagic neurofibromas mentioned that the tissue was very, very friable. Um, one author hypothesized that this could be because of the loose neuro neuronal um, stroma um, that re replaces nor normal adipose tissue leading to vessel frying, um, leading to the vessels being friable. Um, I'm, I'm now going to present two of the hypotheses out there on why there are these vascular structure abnormalities. So in a review with neurofibromatosis, you have normal neurofibromin in a healthy patient. It has an inhibitory res uh, response on the RAS protein. The RAS protein is required for the upregulation of um, gene expression for DNA synthesis. Um, therefore, neurofibromin inhibits the, um, is a tumor uh, suppressor inhibitor because it inhibits the, ultimately inhibits the suppression of DNA synthesis. In patients with neurofibromatosis, you have a decrease in neurofibromin because you either have one defective allele. Um, this leads to a upregulation of the RAS protein, which then leads to upregulation of DNA expression for transcription. Um, because of this upregulation, um, one, of the th one of the theories for the, why the vascular structures are abnormal is that they have, um, and this has been observed in histological studies, that they have proliferation of the endothelial and smooth muscle cells in um, cerebral and um, renal arteries. Um, and it's believed that because of this um, upregulation is attributed to neurofibromin. Um, because the tissue is disorganized, it also is believed to lead to obvious down, downflow of stenosis and occlusion, but also increased fragility from being disorganized. The second theory is that because the, the cell would be um, um, upregulated in um, mitosis, that it would alter the the necessary maintenance and repair process, and this can lead to thinning of the vessel wall. Here's a histological study that, that, that I examined that was mainly focused on the vascularity of a neurofibroma. They used von Will Willebrandt's factor as an antibody stain um, to localized um, vessels within the fibroma. Uh, it was reported that it's a common misconception that masses that are um, white in appearance are not vascular. And the study found that the periphery of the tumor, so the area that was white um, to the naked eye, had a much higher and significantly different, different um, vessel per permeability. So in, a, in a, um, essence, the neurofibromas are more um, vascular on the periphery than on the in, uh, internal area. This was consistent with our dissection in our patient, and it, it's not consistent with von Recklinghausen's um, um, lithographs in his, in, his, in his book. Second question is that I had was, what does the literature say about prior interventions? And I found this was very interesting. Um, this is a very rare um, presentation. Um, and so there, there's only really case studies. And so these are the case studies on hemorrhagic neurofibromas. Um, and as you can see, um, most of these had undergone embolization. There was one study back in 2000 with a um, 30 centimeter by 15 centimeter um, chest wall hematoma. So this is approximately twice as long as um, same depth, same height, um, but 
twice as long uh, hematoma as our patient. Um, this patient had um, initial surgical debridement that they had to go back multiple times and ultimately required over 35 units of packed RVCs. Um, the vast majority of the, of the studies have undergone embolization, um, and I think in these soft tissue masses, uh, even though they're benign, um, they're highly vascularized, and I think embolization um, is, a, is a benefit in resection of these, of these cases. Um, for our, our patient, we couldn't close the defect. It was quite large. We um, ultimately uh, decided to place a KCI wound vac. Um, the patient ended up undergoing a, uh, a sparse, um, split thickness skin graft with plastic surgery um, a week following um, our, our, our procedure. And um, he was lost to follow up for, for us and them um, after discharge. However, he followed up with Dr. McCravey in clinic last month. Um, so I, I'd like to talk, talk a little bit about the cost of medicine of the wound dressing, uh, negative pressure wound dressings because we use them so frequently in the hospital. There was a study done out of Chicago um, that was retrospective in nature and it looked at the, their institutional's cost for the KCI wound vac, compared it to an I-band cost. They also looked at the time requirement for um, wound care nurses to replace the, the wound vac versus the um, I-band um, like off-the-shelf wound vac. For their I-band um, wound vac, they used Curlex um, and they placed it into the wound bed. They um, used a red rubber catheter and they covered it with I-band and then connected it to a, um, a wall suction. So the cost difference is quite um, striking. So the average KCI per day cost of a wound vac is close to 100, whereas for the I-band wound vac, it's close to $4. Um, thank you for the, the time for the podium, um, and do you have any questions? Just a few questions because we're running late. Any questions from the floor, Dr. Vallier? Oh, Dr. McCravey. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's the initial presentation, part of the presentation. And, and I wasn't aware of any association between that and what this gentleman has, which is a myeloproliferative disorder, just a general run-of-the-mill myeloproliferative disorder manifest primarily by a slightly increased white count and a, 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 a polycythemia picture as well with his red cells, but his platelets are, are, are dramatically elevated at f around 500,000. So we are aware in, in this situation, uh, just independent of their neurofibroma, that these patients have qualitative platelet defects. So it's, it may be that this may have contributed to his, you know, bleeding. Or, and I guess the question is, um, sh is there any any preventive uh, option there from a risk issue with, with regard to the qualitative defect on top of this other, these other defects that you described very well? And, and, and then again, back to the original question, did you see any, uh, in your literature search, any mention of associations between other hematologic problems? I um, did, did not initially for neuropopromatosis, but um, I do believe this is not just a single hit um, Presentation, um, the, I, with with based on the, the literature review, I think it, the patients with neurofibromatosis have that underlying defect in platelet aggregation and primary hemostasis. Um, the patient, our patient, had been recently diagnosed with a thalamic stroke, and was placed on another platelet inhibitor, aspirin, um, before presentation. And this was relatively recent; it was two weeks before. This is during the same time that the patient describes the enlargement of his. Um, the mass and the subsequent spontaneous hematoma. Um, uh, that may have been the tipping point. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Valle, any other questions, anybody? Well, I think this is an excellent presentation and, and review that you have done. Uh, what would appear to a general surgeon as a mundane case of just a hematoma that, you know, we normally say, oh, just the bread that drain it. It's very interesting. I believe. This is the case that convinced William to be an internist and a hematologist. I don't think he wants to be a surgeon. So, and for the right reasons. He described the physiology and the, uh, and the disease process very well. I congratulate you very well and good career choice for you. We want you back as a medical oncologist and hematologist in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.